undercover boss. You know what? Even if you haven't seen the reality TV show, just the text, the title, kind of gives you the idea of what this is about. So, unsuspecting employees, right, are working, and a new employee jo- joins a team. That new employee is their boss. And so I don't know how they do it. They have cameras, they follow people. How would they not know? Are they that dense not to know that something's going on here? But through it, the boss has an opportunity to see how things function. And in that, if you've seen it, there's moments where he's receiving abuse from actually his employees, but it's actual, you know, for the TV show, it's his colleague, as well as to see how the institution runs from below. I don't know if it's, pass- if it's possible to have undercover pastor, if that would work, but you get the idea. At the very end, at the reveal moment, you know, and you know with these reality shows, how much is really written and how much is really just spontaneous. But it's an opportunity for the owner to either fire someone, someone's head's going to roll, or maybe his own or her own when he has to admit or she has to admit that, you know what, we could do a little better. This is just to make the bridge to introduce the topic of presence. In a TV show, the presence of a boss at his company makes a lot of sense and is very helpful. But what about presence here? The presence of the one we sing to, the one we adore, the one we serve. Do you know that five months from today, five months today, kids, you know what this is? I thought the kids were going to stay. You know, and I was, I was looking at Phoebe uh, Kim. Last time we spoke here, she came up and said, I've got a problem with you. I'm like, oh, really? Okay. <laughs> Directed to the pastor. She goes, why do you speak more? Why did you speak more than your wife? I'm like, well, I don't know. This is how I, I did let her speak. She did speak. So I'm, she's not here, right? She left. So unless she watches the stream, she may have a few things, a few choice words for me. But kids, in five months from today, it is Christmas Eve. Wow. Can you believe it? So here we are, Christmas in July. And you know what? That's a time when we celebrate the incarnation of Jesus Christ. You know? Him coming in flesh to the world. Now, in that, a lot, there was a lot of drama. We know how King Herod was trying to kill, you know, kill the children in Bethlehem. Horrible story. And also, the, some of the first church councils throughout the centuries after the church was birthed were trying to figure out the incarnation of Christ. Even in the Creed today, it's explaining, trying to understand what does it mean for God, the Word, to become flesh. It wasn't just so that the, the Bible could, could become a bestseller by having all this drama, but rather to show and express the Creator of heavens and earth, His pursuit of His people to be present among us as he also sends us. So today's theme is be present. And the text is going to be coming from the Gospel of John. And it might sound like a misplaced sermon in the liturgical calendar. Like I said, maybe it's supposed to be later in December. True, in December we wait to open our presents. But do we have to wait until one day of the year to talk about the present Emmanuel God with us? That very fact, that miracle affects every one of us everywhere and for all time. The incarnation of Christ. In fact, we mark our year by 2022 in the year of our Lord. Today we're going to see not just how the incarnation through his habitation with his humanity, the manifestation of his majesty, makes possible an invitation to his salvation for you and for me. So the Gospel of John might not depict a typical Christmas scene. There's no manger, no wise men, no angels. But there is Christmas story. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Father, we're grateful for this morning. We're grateful for your word, for your abiding presence, the Holy Spirit with us, among us, and that you would illuminate your word 
So that as Pastor Kyle even said that, we would, Lord, be changed, transformed. And the impact in our hearts here at City View and around where we live and serve. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You know, as John presents in the gospel, he talks about the word, right? The, or in Greek, it's logos. And that was known, logos, if you will, as the internal, eternal, divine, impersonal principle. It was like behind everything was this eternal, divine, impersonal principle. But John is connecting, saying, yes, eternal, divine, but it's personable. It's a person. And not just something that is holding up the whole universe. But the question is, when we look at the incarnation of Christ, the big question is, so what? What does that have anything to do with our life today? The incarnation of Christ, logos, the word becoming flesh, is the miracle that saves us. And it's also the model of our service. A miracle and a model. And as such... We are asked and called by God. Christ is asking us to be his very presence. As, as he was grace and truth in sandals, he's asking us, I'm wearing Clarks. You might be wearing tennis shoes or Nikes, that we could be his grace and truth to those among us who lack gospel access and who do not know Jesus. You know, being near and being present are two different things. You can be near someone physically, but present very far away. It's great to have both, no? So in 2001, when we were sent as missionaries to Spain, it'd be a little hard to plant a church from Elmhurst, Illinois, in Madrid. You know, we had to get on a plane. We had to be near, physically. But we could have been physically near, but like held up in, a, in, our, uh, in our hotel room or where we lived. No, we had to identify. We had to learn the language. We had to eat the food. We sent the kids to school. We fully identified and praise the Lord, we're able to see a church plant, an expression of the body of Christ. Ten years passed, we were asked to become regional leaders of Latin America, everything from Mexico down to Chile. Once again, we had to identify. We had to leave Spain, go to Uruguay. Now, you might say, well, this, at least you didn't have to relearn Spanish. Well, actually, you kind of did because the way they speak down there is a lot different than in, Mex- than in uh, um, Spain. So when we would say, I'm going to the playa, you know what playa is? The beach, right? But when we're down there, I'm going to the playa. It's like playa, playa. It sounds a little different, right? But even there, we had to accustom, we had to become and be present with the people of there. But the difference was this. Being church planters in Madrid was one thing, but now being the leaders, being the bosses, do our international workers really want their boss in their backyard? Let me ask you a question here. How many of you would love to have Pastor, Pastor Kyle, Pastor Brandon as neighbors? <laughs> Sorry. Let me just take a drink of water. Could be a little awkward, but I'm looking at Pastor Kyle and I'm wondering, I wonder if he's the kind of guy at the first snowfall. Imagine, we're actually thinking about snow, talking about snow right now. I'm wondering, if anyone, is anyone a neighbor? Maybe? Okay. Are you the kind of guy that might actually shovel the whole walk of the whole neighborhood? If that was the case, then I would say, this is a good thing to be your neighbor. <laughs> well, I'm not trying to put you on the spot or make you do it, but I guess I just did both. Okay, yes, yeah, someone else who's, who's that, right. But when we talk about being present, being present in Spain, being present in Uruguay, being present here where you guys live in DuPage County. The presence of God was long before the incarnation that we celebrate at Christmas. There are times throughout, from creation to the manger, there are times where right there in the Garden of Eden, God was present, walked with Adam and Eve, uh, spoke with Moses in the burning bush, the pillar of fire that was guiding the Israelites, in the still small voice with Elijah, God was present. But there was something special that we read about, very special, I should say, in the book of John, where the glory of the Word, who spoke all into creation, all into existence. When we're reading that creed today, that's this text. That's the reality of the incarnation. That's the answer to the so what. Why is this so important? Why would we get up on a Sunday to even listen to this? 
Why would he get up on a Monday and, and he actually engage in life if this wasn't true? If the, mir- if, if the incarnation is the miracle that saves us, it must make an impact in the way we live and the way we are. We saw his glory. We behold the glory, the text says. Sometimes he transfigured himself. Other times the glory was less evident, but very much true. Jesus didn't come as some undercover creator, but rather as a loving, close, identifying, and present Savior, full of grace and full of truth. And so even when we open up the book of John and start all the way at the beginning, and John sounds like Genesis, right? In Genesis, in the beginning, God. uh, John, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, not anything made that was made. In him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. The Word became flesh. Christ's undiminished divinity in unprotected humanity makes salvation possible for you and me. Think about that. All of divinity in humanity, but making salvation possible through us. So here John is talking about the word eternal. Everything was made through him. He is the creator. He gave life. He is light. And he never ceased being God while being fully man being present with us. A.W. Tozer put it this way, the awful, the awful majesty of the Godhead. When we think of history, when we look at the Bible, there are moments where Moses would have face to face with God and his face would be shining. There are other moments we could not see and look and live at the glory of God. The incarnation, the awful majesty of the Godhead was mercifully sheathed in the soft envelope of human nature to protect mankind and I would dare say to save mankind. He wasn't some distant, impersonable force but the word became flesh. God himself dwelling among us who gave life to Adam, life to the animals, light to the world, let there be light, and light to you and me, to mankind. He made his dwelling among us, the text says. Christ habitated with his humanity. For what purpose? To be present with his creation. I have, we have traveled, I'm not sure where Melanie is, I think she's here. Maybe she's not, she's downstairs. She'll catch us later. But we have We've, we've, we've taken up residence in different countries. I know what it means to take up residence in Spain or in Uruguay. But God sending his son, taking residence up with you and me is an amazing, amazing thing. How could finite man ever understand infinite God unless he clothed himself in human flesh? As a dad, how can my kids ever know me unless I am a self-revealing father? a self-disclosing, sharing about the history, about the stories of my life, of who I am. That's Jesus sharing and revealing the Father to us. And in fact, the text talks about even sending other, the prophets and guys like John the Baptist, who was not the light, but he gave testimony to the light, bearing witness so that sinful man could line up and understand and have salvation and to know the word who became flesh, who dwelt among us. Who made his residency here. We have seen his glory, the text says. The glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father. Christ's manifestation of his majesty is his self-disclosure and confirmation of his deity. The evidence of who he is. In the book of John, there's seven signs. The first sign is uh, when Jesus turned water into the wa- in wine, and the last is when he rose Lazarus from the dead. 
These signs are manifestations of his glory to help us understand who he is, to understand the identity of Jesus, and to point us and to make a path so we can have faith in Jesus Christ. It's interesting when he rose Lazarus from the dead. Jesus said in John eleven four, This sickness was not meant for death, but it's for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified in it. Now, you might say, if I was there, if I was present, if I was some undercover Christian from the 20th century but in the 1st century, and I saw some of these signs, I would clearly have lined up with, with Jesus and I would have said, praise the Lord, look what he's done, look at all these signs. But the text says he came to his own and his own people did not receive him. Even at the text when he, when he rose Lazarus from the dead, those went back, people went back. They talked talk to Caiaphas, the high, the high priest at that time. Prophetically, Caiaphas said, hey, isn't it in our best interest that one man dies? If, if, all this, if Jesus is going to raise up a lot of ruckus and the Romans are going to want to come down on us, isn't it better that one man dies instead of the whole nation? Prophetic. Yes. But even to think it's inconceivable for us to be back there and say, oh, what were they missing? What are they missing that we have? The incarnation of Christ is the salvation that is so important that we need. And it's inconceivable to think that as he was here to pierce the darkness of man, that there was a purpose for showing his identity. So you might pull back and say, okay, so the word became flesh. So what? The text says he was full of grace and truth. And when we look at things through the lens of today, we have to look at it through the lens of the cross. It was a cross of Christ where the fullness of God's grace shone most brightly and invites us to salvation. The incarnation of Christ, the word becoming flesh, living among us, We've seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. John Piper is a well-known pastor. I believe he's retired now. He was up in the Twin Cities. He said that Jesus could have come, God could have come as judge and executioner. You know what? We are dead in our trespasses. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death. But he didn't. He came to be the Lamb of God. He came to be the answer to pay the penalty of our sin to make a way to the Lord. So how was Jesus full of truth? He was truth to himself because sin had to be punished. You couldn't look the other way. Sin had to be punished, but he was gracious unto us because he took our place on the cross full of grace and truth. Being our sacrificial lamb. Paying the penalty for us. Being true to himself. You know, this is a message that, okay, well, I guess we're five months ahead. You don't have to preach this at at, at Christmas time because, you know, the incarnation of Jesus, we're just missing some of the Christmas trees up here now. This is a message of presence that makes a difference right now, today. As sent ones, as he sends us, so that in John 20, 21, I think, just as the Father sent him, so he sends us to be present, to be incarnational. It was actually the Apostle Peter, when he was, just after the first Easter, when he was talking to the Sanhedrin, he said, salvation... In Acts, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no one, no other name under heaven given to mankind by which man must be saved. That was a controversial thing to say then. It's even a controversial thing to say now, because when you're talking about salvation, you're implicating that do I need to be saved? Do I have sin? That's not a real talk about uncomfortable conversations. What I love about Jesus' ministry. 
many things, all things, is that it was to real people in real places. I'm thinking of the Samaritan woman at the well. He saw her. He engaged her. She may not, not, not have seen the transformation, the transfiguration, but she saw glory. She beheld his glory. Come and listen to the man who knows everything about me. She gathered her town. His presence there at the well made a difference in her life and that of the community. A little further on, post-resurrection, Peter, right? Peter had this uh, vision from Jesus about, you know, don't call unclean that which I call clean. And that day, he followed some servants that were sent from the north from Cornelius to go and share the gospel. Talking about access, talking about crossing over a huge barrier, a Jew to go to a Gentile. But that day he went. He was grace and truth to that Roman soldier as well as to the whole family. The text tells, tells us that the whole household believed. I doubt today, for those of you who are going to a baseball game, if you're actually going to encounter in the concession line a Samaritan woman. Or if you go to left field because you want to look out there at the game, you're going to encounter a Roman soldier. But we are called, we are invited to be the presence of Christ to those among us, wherever we are. And we can be most like Jesus when we are on task, on mission with him as sent ones. So there's two important things about the incarnation. It's a miracle that saves us, substitutionary atonement, God's justice was paid for, hallelujah. He was most gracious to us and the cross. Where the truth of we, the sin needed to pay for, he took our place. But now, how is this, how is the incarnation of Christ a model for our service? What does that look like? Are we willing to be present? Are we willing to respond and be sent ones from this church, from our families, to the places in which, in where, where we live? And I think we are most in step with the Lord of the harvest as we choose to go to the places where there's not access, where there's not presence, gospel presence, in the places where we work, live, and even overseas. And I think we are, as a church, as Christians, we value incarnational ministry because we have the opportunity to offer and invite people to salvation. To invite lost man to know Father, Father God. And as God is asking each of us to be present where we're at, we also realize that there's others who actually sustain those who are sent through faithful giving and generous prayers. I don't know if you're familiar with the word or the initials MIP, right? Meaningful, impactful presence. Now, who doesn't want their presence to be meaningful and, and impactful, right? I'm thinking of a woman like Maria, who left Haiti to go to the Dominican Republic for a better life. And you know what it's like to be an immigrant crossing lines, vulnerability, being a woman, being an immigrant, not knowing language, and the possibility for exploitation. As she crossed over into the Dominican Republic and eventually made her way all the way to the east end of the island near Punta Cana, Punta Cana might ring a bell like, oh, that's where, yeah, that's right. There's more than 130 resorts that line that part of the uh, Dominican Republic. But you just have to go one kilometer in from the ocean to a place called Monte Verde. Monte, mountain, verde, green. I should have done this in Spanish like I told you, no? I should have done it. Um, it's not, there's no mountain, no, neither is it green. But it's actually a community of Haitian immigrants living there. So how would you be meaningful, impactful presence to someone who doesn't have clean water, no school, no hope, doesn't know the language, their papers are not in order? There are some missionaries from America 
That was just by, it doesn't have to be from America, but in this case it is. Coming, working with the church in Punta Cana, called the Second Mile. Actually called Mud Love. They have a, one of these, one of these uh, bracelets is made of ceramic. 30 of these Haitian women are working in Mud Love. They're making and they're earning a wage so that they don't have to, cover your ears, but you know it, they don't have to prostitute themselves to feed their kids. But they can only employ 30 people. So if you ask the fact that these Christians, these present sent ones, were able to start a school, bring in water, have a church, have a... If you were to ask the kids, is your presence meaningful and impactful? They would say absolutely yes. That gives a platform an opportunity to be heard because the foundational truth that they need to hear that Maria and her other 30, 29 colleagues needs to hear is the love of Jesus Christ. But your MIP can actually make it possible so they can hear the gospel, the incarnational truth of salvation. But what about the 31st person that can't be employed because there's no money? There's still a need, still a necessity. Or I'm thinking about the whole topic of bullying. I know that in the United States, we're not the only ones who experience bullying. If you're personally, in your past, your kid, your grandkid, it's sad. It's a real thing. In the middle of South America, in Paraguay, in the capital of Asuncion, there's a school of 2,000 kids. 1,000 in the morning, 1,000 in, in the afternoon. With a lot of bullying going on. You got the bully, you got the victim, you got the witness. You know that the school was desperate when they actually go to a pastor for help, <laughs> right? But they came to one of our local pastors, his name was Angel. Pastor Angel, you got to help us out. We have this bullying problem. Do you have anyone in your church? Do you have anyone? Can you help us? There's a couple missionaries and we could, you know, how could this church have meaningful, impactful presence in this neighborhood? The school was coming in asking. Little did they know that Pastor Angel was really a demon as a kid. By the age of 16, he was kicked out of school. He had punched out the front tooth of the principal. He broke the rib of, his, of, of the principal's secretary. He was a mess. He wanted violence. And now, 20, 30 years later, they're asking him to be the, the, the manifest, the presence of God. To, are you kidding me? God does have a sense of humor, but more importantly, he can change lives. You ask those kids now, does it make a difference that Pastor Angel and the church are actually present in that location? Giving hope to the kids, to the victims. He can identify with the bully because he, he was a jerk. He was violent. But what a platform to be heard and listened to. By the, and people from the church go to that school and now some of the kids and parents are actually going to school so they can hear the gospel and be transformed. DuPage County. I know there's immigrants. I know there's bullies. I'm not saying this is the play that God is asking you to run for your MIP. One of the important things I know of this church with MIP is safe, am I saying right? Safe homes? Safe families. Oh, for sure. For sure, that's been an amazing, amazing opportunity. When I was on staff here, one of the MIPs we had, instead of having vacational vacation Bible school, we did these backyard Bible clubs. So we'd go to the Booth's house, Gagers, uh, Ronnie's, and we'd, let's go to the neighborhood. Let's go to the garage. You know, if Steve Jobs can start Apple in a garage, why can't we start a church in a garage? And there, right there in the neighborhoods, to be close, to be present with the people. I don't know what that's going to look like here at City View for this summer, for your next step, where you're working. But I know someone who does. If we listen and we say, Lord, what do you have for us? And know you're doing stuff and it's amazing. But to be present is costly. As Jesus. His very present here cost him his life that he gave up. There's a financial reality as well. People aren't just waiting to see, yeah, tell me about Jesus. 
in many contexts around this world. Melanie and I want to say thank you to you guys. Thank you for your support so that we can be sent ones. We can be an extension of City View in Latin America. We can be his presence because we're sustained by you through your prayers and through your giving. And we are grateful. We're thankful. You know that there's one church, one invisible church with many visible congregations. City View is a visible congregation, right? But we're part of the body of Christ, the invisible church. Some people say, well, I think Pastor Kyle said, yeah, they're from the Christian and Missionary Alliance. That's the visible reflection of the, uh, of the invisible church. And probably our most, but who is that? It's got a lot of names. It's kind of hard to say. CMA. Well, probably our most famous, I don't know, person of the movement would be A.W. Tozer, right? So for 30 years, he was on the south side of Chicago preaching. Even though he died in 1963, he's still a spiritual influencer today. The second president of the CMA was a guy named Paul Rader. That has some importance here in Chicago. Are there any Moody students here? Oh, they're out, out for summer, of course. Um, but he was, the, uh, he was a pastor of Moody Church from 1915 to 1921. He was the second president of the, US, of the CMA. But this is just getting to the founder of the CMA, who was a Canadian from Prince Edward Island. So from Prince Edward Island to Toronto to Hamilton to Louisville to New York City. A.B. Simpson, Albert Benjamin Simpson. So he was there at a Presbyterian church preaching the gospel and got to a point where he realized, you know what, it was Halloween, October 31st, 1881. He resigned. Trick or treat, right? He resigned from, the, from being pastor there. He had nothing, nowhere to go. But he realized that for him to be present in New York City, to do what God asked him to do, he had to resign. And especially to reach out to all the immigrants that were coming. It was in 1882, January 1st, right? I think you've got in your bulletin uh, insert a quote that I want to read. It was that day, a day normally January 1st. What do we do on January 1st? We're sleeping in, getting up late, and he is writing this. A.B. Simpson is writing this. Because you have to understand, the five years prior to the writing of this, he shares in another article, he says, there's been 165,000 people that have come to New York City in the five years prior to the writing of this. That's like a city of Cleveland or of Buffalo um, arriving to the shores of New York City. And here's what he says. Here's what he investigated. There was not one new church that was planted or Christian movement. And he's like, set, set, sound an alarm. New York, how could it be? So many people coming and we're not, how, we're not even planting churches to reach the ones that are coming to us. And he said, we've fallen asleep. We've fallen asleep. He writes this and I love how he writes it. We've been discussing nice theories and preaching beautiful sermons and letting the people perish. They have been doing far worse. They have been riding, the church that is, we've been riding in heaven in palace sleeping cars. My grandpa used to work, I can, you can fact check this, I got some uncles back there, but at the Pullman, you know, down on the south side of Chicago, used to clean the, the railroad. There were beautiful cars, right? There weren't airplanes back 140 years ago. But in the church, we're listening to sermon after sermon, just falling asleep, riding up to celestial heaven, while train load after train load of people are plunging into a, the abyss and saying, no one, no man cared for my soul. That's what's being shouted. That's what is getting the err of A.B. Simpson. And so he writes, and this is what is in, our, in your text. Christians, we've got to repent. Christians, we need a, fill, a, a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. And we need Revival. In the church. I wonder if it's what he wrote 140 years ago is any different than what we need today. He says this let's Christians then awake from their respectability. Let religion cease to be an amusement and let it become a holy trust. 
Let the churches open their doors freely to all classes and let members go to their neighborhoods and invite them in. Let the public halls and theaters be open for evangelistic services and let plain, earnest men go wherever they can, gather the masses together in little communities or great, and preach the gospel in the power of the Spirit and the simplicity of love. Let the interest of our church be forgotten in the honor of Christ and the peril of souls. Let us be sure that we are saved and let us be sure that men are lost. And then let us speak as men that believe. Let us give up our plans of pleasure and self, selfishness and ease and prepare for a winter of earnest work. Let us put away our idols and turn from our abominations. And above all, let us cry mightily to him for the word of power and the breath of life that alone can change this valley of dry bones into an exceeding great army of living souls and soldiers of the cross. And we shall find that there are resources, more resources among us, if touched by the consecrating power, to save the city, to save the world. The Christian and Mission Alliance, the movement, began with seven people in a prayer meeting 140 years ago that now has an expression in 80 different countries of 6 million people because one man did not fall asleep. The inc- Why is the incarnation of Christ so important? Jesus didn't become flesh and dwell among us so that the church could sleep so the church wouldn't give a rip about those who are dying without knowing Jesus. For A.B. Simpson and the Christian Mission Alliance movement, that was the stake in the ground 140 years ago. Jesus did not become flesh in the incarnation just so city view that we could just sleep and build a beautiful building but rather to be the very presence of God in our community. And God can use both. We are to be sent ones. We are to be present, His presence where we're sent. In the tradition here at this church, there's some obedience and sacrificial giving. I am blessed to be in a line of many workers who have been sent out. Herb and Debbie Lamp, Right? Diane Elias and Denise Schumann, Jeff and uh, Candy Campbell, my sister Faith and Greg Hurst, us, even Mike and Hannah Schutz, and I, and I probably have missed some other ones. You guys have facilitated the presence of God in many places around the globe because you believed in the incarnation of Christ makes a difference here and over there. But it's not just something in the past, it's something in the present and the future as well. I don't know who here is the next missionary to be sent, but I do know all of us are to be present. All of us are to be present where we're at to be Jesus, to close the gap for those who don't have access, who who came in full of grace and truth, that we can be his grace and truth to those who do not yet know. In this church, you have an amazing Staff who brings God's word faithfully every week. As you recite the creeds and live out the creed, this is rich soil. Rich soil for to be present here and things to grow. I just, I love the picture even here of things grow, of light, of shining, of Jesus here in DuPage County. But it's also rich soil for those to hear a young Middle-aged or even old, a a give bag. You don't have to just be 30 to be a missionary, to be sent because, oh, I've got 30 more years of life. You can be even right now. We've got some people who are being sent 65, second, second career. But the soil is rich. God is good. The, the, the fields are white unto harvest. The need is still great. There's still that 31st Haitian woman that needs to know Jesus down in the Dominican Republic. There's still another thousand kids in the middle of Paraguay that need to know that Jesus loves them and not just because someone is bullying them, beating them up. In fact, in our church in Uruguay, one of our deep 
friends and fam- uh, friends are not part of the church yet. We pray for them. They called us up while we were back here on home assignment. We're here in the U.S. this year for visiting, for, for preaching, for teaching, and as many of you know, also for, um, uh, for some medical reasons. And thank you for your prayers. Melanie is healed. She is better. And we praise God that she didn't need chemotherapy or um, what else is there? Radiation. And we're grateful. We're grateful for that. But this family called us and said, hey, w- w- re- remind me, when is youth group down in Montevideo? And Pastor, Bra- uh, Pastor Brand has been in Montevideo. He came to visit. Many of you actually came to visit, uh, visit us in Spain and, and do some ministry. Yeah. Karen Anderson, you were there. But right there in Montevideo, this, um, this family said, yeah, you know what? Because our son Pedro is getting, he's getting bullied at school. And we know that there's a safe place in the youth group. These guys are not that, you know, they're not looking for, they're not looking to know Jesus. They're looking for a safe place for their kid to have fellowship. But you know what? They're, he's going to find Jesus. He's going to find people who love Jesus in that youth group. So you ask that family, what's a, was that, am I, you know, being meaningful, impactful presence? Was it, was it worth being there? I'm telling you, church, by you sending us and supporting us, but you could send from all the list of all the missionaries on the website, everyone would have a story of being the very presence of Christ in a place that you might not be able to be there. Maybe you're not the one to learn the language to go and do the task or to even have the, if it's not just a preaching, but even if you're doing something vocationally, but you're making it possible, you're facilitating that the gospel continues to go, that the incarnation of Christ does mean something, It's a miracle that saves us. And it's also the model of our service. In this world, there's a lot of spiritual darkness, no doubt. There's spiritual blindness. We were just in, I was talking to Pastor Brandon, we were just in Cleveland and listening to some of our brothers and sisters who are in very dark places of the world where there is demonic oppression, where there's manifestations of 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 the other world. But you know what? There is manifestation of Christ. We just don't have to read the scriptures to see it and then water to wine, raising of Lazarus. He is doing stuff right now among us, changing a life like Pastor Angel, changing lives in the Dominican Republic. And you know what? Changing lives in this very church. Yes, there's more lives to be changed. There's more. But in full of grace and truth, Jesus is here and he's asking us and he's inviting us to extend his invitation to be his very presence. I know that the Gaius team here, led by Dave Kim and others, that you know what? They're vigilant. They're on their knees. This spiritual apathy and a spiritual spiritual darkness is not penetrating this church. It's not penetrating this pastoral staff, these elders, because these elders care about Scripture. They care about the loss. The incarnation of Christ makes all the difference in their lives. That's why they're getting up to preach and to be here and to lead the church and to lead the church through those new doors as the church comes and as this church goes out for the glory of God. So that it would be said of this church of City View that Christ would be brought glory. I'm just going to ask you to stand to receive this prayer. A.B. Simpson was saying, let us awake. He was sounding an alarm. I think it would be rude if I had an air horn, but you get the point. You probably wouldn't appreciate that. But that's what he's saying. Church, this is the, our opportunity. May, and I, if the musicians want to come up, I think we got some more uh, reflection and song, but God is so good. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We saw his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Let's pray. Father God, that scripture, the incarnation of Christ is so important. Chronologically, it comes before the crucifixion, but without the incarnation, there'd be no crucifixion. There could be no uh, d- resurrection. There could be no... You paid... You, by coming flesh, made it all possible that we could know you, that finite man could be known by infinite God, that you could redeem us.
because you love us. You've pursued us from heaven to here and you're asking us and inviting us to populate heaven by sharing your good news with a dying and needy world. Father, I thank you for City View and I pray for the pastoral staff and for all the pastors here, all of these. It's a, pri- it's a, 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 a priesthood of believers as all are going forward, going out to be present. But Lord, if you are working, and you are working, I take that back, you are working, as you're calling, may we listen and have the opportunity to respond. And I think there are people here who would respond and say, Lord, here I am, send me. I'm grateful for this church that there is a commitment to the formation of disciples, formation of disciples here in DuPage County and to the ends of the earth. Help them in their discernment to understand and to guide and to lead those who would be sent ones and help them to continue to facilitate those who are sent and who continue to send. Thank you, Jesus, for becoming flesh. Not impersonal, but very personal. Who created all things, who holds up all things, who holds up this church for the impact and the glory of this nation and this world. We pray these things in the blessed name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen.